Well, we've been uh, talking about worship um, as, as we go into the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians. We're going through that together. And as, as I was looking at this and thinking about, you know, just worship in general, and thinking of all the different styles and the, the manners in which we worship, even just right here in Protestant churches in Lexington, I mean, it's, the diversity is so broad, so huge. I mean, right now as we worship some places, there are some, some congregations where everything is spontaneous, the pastor won't have any kind of notes. He'll just open up his Bible and just preach what he or she thinks that God is giving them to preach. And the service will go on for two, three, four hours. You should thank me that you're here, right? Two, three, or four hours. You know, we get to an hour and 15 minutes and people start going like this. First church I ever preached in had a clock that was on the wall on the side that actually had a chime at, at 12 noon. And I knew that if I went over 12 noon, that nobody would hear anything. In fact, they, for a while, they had a siren that went off at 12 o'clock in town. And uh, this is a little side story. And uh, this was 1986. And I actually, one time, just in passing, said something to some of the men in the church. I said, man, that siren's just killing me. The, the next council meeting of the city, they brought that up, and they said, Brother Van Zandt, once, once the, the siren stopped, and that was the last week that they ever... And I thought, man, why didn't I ask for something else? <laughs> you know? But anyway. So there's some churches that have just total spontaneity like that. And then, and then we have, um, you know, what would be called traditional churches where... Um, the, the order is set, and it's all in a bulletin. I, I'm not knocking this stuff. I'm just giving this sort of diversity. And sometimes even that order of what they do is not even set by the congregation, but set by somebody beyond the congregation. And this is what acceptable worship is, and this is how you do things. And, and this is like, you know, like this. I've had a few times, you know, I used to do a traditional service and a contemporary service, and every once in a while in the traditional service, something would happen, the bulletin wouldn't get printed. And man, you talk about just really upsetting some people. Um, I always said, give them last week's. Because <laughs> they, they want to sit with something in their hand. They, if they don't have anything in their hand, they're lost in worship. And everything is down there, everything that's going to be said and when it's going to be said, you know. But that's just really diverse from that spontaneous... And then, you know, there are churches that have, um, there's no bulletin, they post no order of worship, but still everything is precisely timed out down to the minute. I mean, it all appears to be spontaneous, but really it's all highly orchestrated. Even down to on the back wall for the worship leader, there'll be a clock that counts down. So when the video feed from the mother church starts coming in, They'll be ready for that video feed. You know what I mean, and and they everything has to end precisely on time because we got 15 minutes to move these people out of here to get the next people in. Very highly organized, but appears to be spontaneous. Huge variety. We go back a few years in American history, right here in Lexington. You know, a hundred years ago, you would come to worship, and in almost every church, you would sing for an hour. You would worship for an hour. The preacher would preach at least an hour and a half, or he, and it was always a he, would be considered to be lazy. Then you would eat a meal together, and then you would come back in, and you would ask questions for a couple of hours, and you would be instructed about what he preached. I mean, and then you'd have some more prayers. That was what things were like, you know, 100 years ago, 120 years ago. Things change. Step back a little bit further into Revolutionary War time. Uh, Charles Wesley, uh, we're talking about this for worship. He would take a, a song that was sung in the bars, change the words to it, and make it a hymn. Thought nothing about that at all. Even a little bit before that, uh, if you came to worship, no praise band, of course, you would chant. You would have things that you would chant. And, you know, or you might go to a church where everything was in Latin. You didn't understand anything that was being said. Everything was in another language, but that was what was called worship. 
My point, you know, worship and content is constantly changing. So for us, I mean, what's the correct way? I mean, how does God want us to do it? Well, obviously, the way that we're doing it, right? That's exactly correct. That's what we all think, is the way that we do it must be God's way. Not so sure that that's true. And, you know, you might think that the New Testament doesn't tell us anything, and and you can be sure that if there was a passage of Scripture that said, well, you're to start at 1030 and with a call to worship, followed by some singing, then have an offering, then have communion, then have some prayer, then some more preaching, followed by a laugh song and a benediction, Every church would be trying to do that, but we know that that isn't in Scripture. Uh, even we look in Scripture at the few places that we have, and there's a great deal of variety. We don't have anything specific, but we do have some general guidelines, and that's where we are today. I want to take our time today with that. And it's from 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, beginning with the 26th verse, if you're one of those people that follow along. And uh, you can uh, see how well we are doing if you read this. Now, before we get to this, the first 26 verses of this chapter deal with the misuse and use of the gift of tongues and worship at Corinth. And, man, they, they had some wild stuff going on at Corinth. It was really chaotic. People were standing up and, and speaking in tongues all at the same time. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you've been in that kind of experience or not. I, I'm not judging that. I'm not saying, but it, but it is chaotic. And I think Paul would say to that practice the same thing today that he did then. But people were standing up and, and using this heavenly language that God had given them to build them up. And they were speaking in tongues. And there's just a lot of confusion. And also, there were some people that were like, you know, first-time visitors and, you know, seeing what this Christianity was like, and they were coming in, and they were going, these people are nuts. These people are crazy. Listen to them. Look at what's going on. Now, Paul never scolded them for speaking in tongues. In fact, he said in, in verse 5, here 14.5, he said, I wish you all spoke in tongues. So if we're looking at this and we're saying, well, tongues is bad, you can't do that. Uh, later on, verse 18, he said, I speak in tongues more than all of you do. So this isn't a, about, uh, this isn't a negative thing about tongues. Tongues are good, but there's a problem. He said, instead of everyone speaking in tongues, he said, give, give prophecy preference. A prophecy is when someone speaks out a word from God, encourages the body, speak, you know, it's, it's a revelation. And he said, instead of everyone doing that, I'd rather you all, you know, had room for prophecy. He says, prophecy builds people up, but if you're just going to stand up and speak in a tongue that nobody knows anything about, you're just building yourself up, okay? And it's not about you. It's, it's about the church. So now, here we are at verse 26. I, I covered those first 25 verses with that real incident, didn't I? Okay. First, uh, here we are, 26. He says, what is the outcome of this, brothers and sisters? When you meet together, each one has a psalm, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All these things must be done to build up the church. Now, the first thing that I notice here is he says, each one. <laughs> each one has a psalm. Each one has a gift. A picture that he paints is of complete involvement of what he intends for the church, for every person to be involved in the worship service. And everyone came with, with something. You know, when we have a, a potluck dinner here, uh, we often call it a plan pot because we just don't have that much faith that people <laughs> will bring good dishes. So, you know how we do. We put a, a thing up on the board and we say, you know, so many desserts and so many salads and because we don't want, you know... 10 things of cookies from Kroger uh, for the meal. So we, we have to have some variety. We call it plan pot. And um, each of everybody brings something, you know, to the, to the plan pot. Strange that when it comes to worship, uh, it's not so much a plan pot, not so much even a potluck, but more of kind of a catered meal is the way that American Christianity does it. Now we, we pay people um, to sing for us. We pay people to preach for us. Uh, we pay professionals, okay, to worship 
that we might engage. And it's, it's not so much here at the gathering because we're small, you know. But if you go to a larger church, they'll, they'll, everybody that does something almost is, has some professional role in that. And, um, you know, by and large, we just kind of got into a rut where we watch and we listen and we consume and we evaluate. Is that, is that too harsh? Am I being too mean here? I, th- I, think I'm, I think that's true, isn't it? I mean, by and large, that's kind of the way that Americans do it most of the time. The, the only time that worship is threatened is one of, if one of the professionals has a problem and can't be there. Then it's, oh my, what are we going to do? You know, um, we've got a big problem. For the most part, we come to be inspired, and it's really kind of more of a consumer mindset than it is a member mindset. See, outside of a lot of worship places, this Sunday there's going to be a conversation that takes place. And what's going to happen is two guys or girls are going to be walking out to the car, and one of them is going to look at the other one and go, Did you get anything? Did, did you get fed? And they will go, No. He's just not bringing it the way the old pastor did. He's just not. Mm, I didn't get anything out of it. I'm sorry. I didn't get I didn't either, you know. Hey, um, I got a buddy that's going to that other church. Man, it's exploding. And that guy's really, really good. Uh, he really feeds you. I think I'm going to go over there next weekend. His buddy says, well, what, what service are you going to go to? I, I think I'd go to because I'm, I'm not getting fed here at all, man. I'm just, you know, we got to do something. I mean, we went to the catered meal and... I didn't like the food. I, we need to get someplace that's got better gourmet catered food because, you know, they're declining in value here and um, I need to get fed. I'm sorry. I mean, is that being sarcastic, mean? I don't think. Uh, that's just being real, isn't it? I mean, isn't that just being real? Because that, that's going to happen today. Many places right here in Lexington, that's going to happen. Somebody's going to say, I didn't get fed there, and I'm going to go someplace else. Were you fed? I mean, and I I can't help but see the contrast between this, were you fed in American culture, and each one brings something in first century Corinth. You see, I mean, that's a huge gulf between that. And I, I'm not assigning blame to this. I mean, the pastors blame the people. They say, well, that's what they want. Got to give them what they want, you know. And the people blame the pastors. That's what they do. We don't know anything any better. And reality is, is although the catered meal may be consistent, may be manageable, you may be able to roll that out for anybody that walks in. There's just something about Martha's casserole. Do you know what I mean? Martha's casserole that she makes for the, for the potluck dinner. I'm pushing the metaphor about as far as I can put it, push it. But, but there's something about a potluck meal where everybody brings something that just is going to taste better than that gourmet meal that's catered all the time. Each one. We see a huge difference between the practices of the early church and our practices today, and I'm not saying that we have to imitate exactly what they did. It, it, that might be kind of weird. They actually were probably a church about the size that we are. Most of the churches met in homes, and a home could hold 40 to 50 people, so that's about where we are with kids. Most Sundays we get 50 or 60, and every person was important in the body of Christ. And when they assembled for worship, there was space and there was time for them to use their gift and for the gift to be distributed in the in the church. But Corinth wasn't the only church, and things changed. I mean, culture changes. So worship is, is always changing, and the needs change, and the way that they worship changes. But there are some things, some principles about worship that just go across cultural lines and don't change. So Paul lists five things. Our translation says a psalm. I think that's very accurate, and usually they'll call it a hymn. Um, pretty straightforward that the psalms were probably what they're talking about. There are a few hymns that are actually in Scripture, in New Testament Scripture, but probably would have included some prayers. Most of the, the hymns are kind of in prayer. Some of our songs are a prayer that we even sing on in contemporary ones. There would have been a word of instruction again. Fairly simple to understand. That's, that's preaching or teaching. Uh, that would take place. There'd be a revelation. 
basically just a, a, a word from God, a prophetic word from God, where God says something to the people that are there. It's this is not an ecstatic utterance. This this is you know someone stands up and say I I, I feel impressed by God to share this. I think uh, think this that God is telling me this. There's a tongue. By by that, Paul just simply means an individual speaking in a language they they've not learned. It's uh, the Spirit speaking through them. And then he says an interpretation, and this is when someone is given the ability to interpret what is being said in that tongue, that becomes a revelation or a prophecy. Now, I don't think that we should make this law. I don't think that we should codify what he says here and say these five things have to be present every time. This is not, I don't think, an exhaustive list. I think it's some things that Paul just says as the normal practices in churches at his time. Um, these five ingredients are not everything that can be done or should be done. Two of these five, we do. Three, we don't. Uh, we'll, we'll say a little bit more about that later. But the important point here is that each one brings a gift. Everybody that comes brings something to the potluck, you know, and every person is important. I really like that. And he says that for that this is good because that way the church might be built up. Worship should build up the church. He uses the word edification, and a lot of your translations is going to say edify or edification. Our translation says build up. He uses that eight times in this chapter. That is one thing that he really hits about worship, is that worship should build up the church. And that's his problem with tongues, is that, you know, tongues doesn't do that. And since no one knows what's being said, they're not being built up. Instead, he says, every member brings something from God. The assembly is being dominated there in Corinth by a few people who are standing up and using this gift, and nobody else gets a chance. And the goal or the guideline, he says, is to build up the church. And it's central, it's most important, like everything else that Paul has told to the Corinthians as we've been going through this now for three months. It's all about the health of the church. And when the church is healthy, the individual is healthy. But it's not about the individual. Now, when it comes to tongues, you know, I'm going to be kind of a smart aleck here, but you get used to that. I've heard some sermons that might as well have been in tongues because nobody knew what was being said. Things were, uh, words were used and uh, sentences that went on and on and on and on. And it's like, you know, who are you trying to impress? Are you trying to impress God? I think God surely is impressed by your vocabulary, but we haven't got the slightest idea what you're talking about, ma'am or sir. But it's just a lecture, you know. Um, I could do that. Not really. But... It, but you know what I mean. You've been, you've been in that place where it just goes on and on and nobody gets built up. Instead, people get pushed down, you know. They, they get, it's 20 minutes, it seems like it's three hours. You don't have to speak in tongues to be boring. You don't have to speak in tongues to, to, to not be understood. And the purpose here is to build up the church. All right, let's go on. Then he proceeds in the next several verses um, to talk about how this should be done. Verse 27. If some speak in a tongue, then let two or the most three, one at a time, and someone must interpret. However, if there's no interpreter, then they should keep quiet in the meeting. They should speak privately to themselves and to God. In the case of prophets, let two or three speak and, and have the rest evaluate what is said. And if some revelation comes to someone else who is sitting down, the first one should be quiet. You can all prophesy one at a time so that everyone can learn and be encouraged. And again, you know, I, I notice here that Paul says two or three. See, he, he's not giving a law to us. Yeah, let two or three speak, you know, just, just a few is what he's saying. So it, it's not like we have to get together and say, well, we have to have three prophecies, so we're waiting until three people speak, you see. Paul gives the, the Corinthians these instructions about how they should handle their gifts, and he limits to two or three, and then he, and he puts some restrictions on both. For tongues, he says there should be an interpreter. 
Um, so everybody gets built up and prophecy, you know, you should be in order. Not everybody talking at once, but one person talks. And so then we go on and we find out why in the next verse, verse 32, he says it very clean, uh, clearly. The spirits of prophets are under the control of the prophets. God isn't a God of disorder, but of peace. And Paul wraps up this discussion by making this point. He said, this should not get out of control. This should be a peaceful uh, orderly meeting. You know, and sometimes people that that want to really emphasize the moving of the Spirit, um, things do get kind of disorderly. And, you know, Paul's bringing us back. Chaos and disorder are not characteristics of God. God is not a God of disorder. He's got a peace. And uh, obviously in this situation, Paul's speaking to that. But the tension here that I see also is, is, is uh, what is perceived as being the mind and what is perceived as being the Holy Spirit. People often think that if you're in the Holy Spirit, that the mind is completely checked out. It's like you're in a trance or something, you know, in this ec- ecstatic state. And Paul says, no. He says, the prophet is in control. The prophet is not in some ecstatic state, but the mind is very much engaged and you can control your mouth. You know, you don't have to speak. And the memory bank is there to be used by the prophet and very much at your disposal. So worship that is what we would say spirit led is not void of intellect, but actually moves, I think, into a higher plane where the person speaks the mind of Christ and has access to that. Prophecy very, very important. Um, years ago, uh, Denzel Washington did an interview with 60 Minutes, and in it he shared a really important story in his life. He was in college at the time, and he was dealing with some questions about his future and wondering which way he was going to go with his life. And he was sitting in his mother's beauty salon, and he saw an elderly lady there, and she was staring at Denzel, and suddenly she spoke to his mother. She says, give me a piece of paper, and they gave uh, the mom, gave this older lady, and she said, I-, I have a word for Denzel. And on the paper she wrote, you will speak to millions. And when Denzel asked his mother, you know, who the woman was, she said, well, she's one of the oldest women at Mount Vernon, which was their church, and she has the gift of prophecy. Washington pointed to that day as a defining moment in his life that determined which way he would go because that lady had practiced her gift and she knew the voice of God and she was confident in the Spirit enough to give it to him. And to this day, uh, he's extremely, you know, very gifted, important actor, but he still goes to church, still practices his faith. He's speaking to millions. I think I know what he's talking about. I don't speak to millions. But, you know, years ago, a woman in our church um, listened and heard from God and um, courageously stepped out one day, and she wrote down some prophecy that she had received for Nine and I. So that was thirty, almost 30 years ago, 29 years ago. And she gave it, gave it to us on a piece of paper, and we stuck it away. It was this August... That, that God just kind of beat me up for a couple days. And I remembered. Uh, we were in worship at another church, and I remembered as the, the, the man that was opening the worship that day said something about God said something to you years ago that perhaps you've forgotten. And it just all came back, and I remembered that prophecy, what was said to me, and what God told me was that you never received that. You didn't want it. And, you know, I remembered what was being said again, and and God, that was, I, I think, come back to that August day, I think that was a very important part of my life because I think God was saying, you know, you, it's been 29 years that I gave this to you, and you have never liked that. You never wanted to be what this prophecy said that you would be or do. But God had been faithful through that lady and because um, she listened to the Spirit and, and she was faithful enough to step out and give us something that really probably at the time didn't make a whole lot of sense. God's not a bully. You know, God, God doesn't push us around. He gently waits for us to be willing to receive from Him what He wants to give us. 
And I can't, I can't help but wonder what Paul's message would be to us today, you know, where we perhaps have the, the opposite problem of chaos um, and the fear of having disorder. Um, perhaps some people have been silenced. Um, maybe, maybe we just hear from one or two or three. And, I mean, the reality is we kind of fit that mold of American Christianity where we prefer to control exactly what happens in worship rather than trusting the Spirit in the people here. I mean, let's be honest about this. Aren't you kind of afraid of the gifts of the Spirit? I mean, isn't this kind of messy? <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen? We, we let this, the Lord loose in this room. My gosh, things could get way out of control. We might run on an extra 10 minutes. <laughs> right? Somebody might say something that would make somebody else uncomfortable. Or they might cry or, or something. And yet I think I could speak for most of us here today in saying that we certainly, I think all of us want to receive what God has for us, and we don't want to stop Him from speaking to us. The reality is, is that the prophet is subject to... Th uh, the prophecy is, excuse me, the prophecy is subject to the mind and the will of the prophet. And we are oftentimes kind of shutting doors and saying, God, if you want to speak to us, then speak to us through him, all right, or through her. But reality is, is that God chooses the wind blows, as Jesus said, in John 3, the Holy Spirit is like wind, and the wind blows where the wind wants to blow. We, we can't tell the wind where to blow. You know, for, for years, um, I've, been, I've been silent about some things um, like, like this because, you know, quite honestly, I thought it, it frightened some of you. I really did. I thought it scared some of you. I thought, I don't think they're ready to hear this. Boy, you probably know more about it than I do. But it's not the kind of thing that, you know, well, let me just say this. Those days are over. Those days are past. Uh, the gifts of the Spirit build people up. And maybe, maybe we've got a few muscles that aren't quite as strong as what spiritual muscles, muscles that aren't quite as strong as they used to be. Or let me mix my metaphor a little bit more. Maybe our potluck is not quite as rich as it could be because we're saying, let's plan the potluck. All right, let's tell who's going to be gifted by the Spirit every Sunday. Let's not let the Lord do this because who knows what he's going to do. Paul closes his chapter by saying in verse 39, he says, So then, brothers and sisters, use your ambition to try to get the gift of prophecy, but don't prevent speaking in tongues. Wow. Now, just a, as a close here, just a few words to the church. Um, leave some room for the, for the gifts. Le leave some room for God. Okay, let's, let's give him some space here. Let, let's, let's not program everything that we do. So if God wants to do something, he has to do it out in the hallway. Let's, let's leave some room in worship for God to speak and God, God to do some talking. Uh, number two, I would say, is accept that you will be gifted. Accept that, each one. It's not professionals that are gifted. Everybody is gifted. Accept that. Um, and number three, make yourself available to God. I want to encourage you to make yourself more available to God. You know, next week, this is it's remarkable. I did not plan this out. I, I, honestly, I did not plan this out. I'm not that smart to plan this out. Next week, we have scheduled to do some kind of some spiritual, a spiritual gift survey. It's, a, it's just 80 questions, and we're going to have a kiosk set up back here, and, and you can discover for yourself uh, what your spiritual gift are, is. And, you know, some, some of us are teachers, and some of us are, are prophets, and, you know, some other things. We're going to go out off of Ephesians 5. But uh, it's called the Fivefold Ministry, and uh, I just can't wait to get that. A few of us have taken it, and boy, it just it just nailed right where we are, you know. And I just can't wait for us to do that as a church, and, and we'll we'll get some more encouragement as to 
as to what God wants to do in us, in, in this body right here, how God's put us together. So, um, you know, that's, that's what's on the horizon. And that actually, we, we talked about that way back in August, and, and God arranged Corinthians to fall just perfectly here, the preaching on Corinthians, so it just works out so well that we come to this part of Corinthians, and then we're going to do that. So I want to give you some time to, to get ready for that. Well, let's, let's, um, let's just take a few minutes and, and sit silently with God for a minute and, and listen, if you would, please. As deep cries out 